Metro Exodus is a little different from your usual AAA market item. Because in this very small pool of video games that have released so far in 2019 like Tom Clancy's The Multiplied 2, Apes X Legends and Shakiro Shadows Die 5,000 times. All of them have a very similar gameplay approach, keeping you on your toes with constant action and decision making. And then along comes Metro Exodus that wants you to take things very slow. I think you know what I mean. You might initially think though, if it's different, then isn't that a good thing? Like if something sets itself apart from everything else, doesn't that open up new opportunities? Well, yes. And no. This game is definitely worth it, but I can't stress this enough. You will not know that unless you take the game for what it is. And to start off, I want to make it clear that I am a big fan of the Metro games. I made a video back in September talking about how I believed that it was one of the more underrated games out there to play. I haven't read the books, however. I know I'm going to get hammered in the comments for this, but I'm coming around to that format. And Metro Exodus got me excited. It honestly felt like a very plausible direction for Metro to take. One subjective argument from the previous entries was that the games often were extremely linear. Boom! Metro Exodus is here to change that. A new crafting system allowing you to change your equipment on the fly that could lead to many different possibilities and dynamic choices. All while visiting many different locations, each with their own story, landscape and activities. It genuinely felt like a perfect direction for the series to go, bringing in plenty of new additions while still retaining that old formula that the franchise had established itself as. It's what a sequel is meant to be. And after finishing my second playthrough, most of these changes live up to the expectations. If, of course, you accept the game to be itself. Stop beating around the bush, what does the game often get up to? Well, it's clunky at times. Normally at the worst of times. There are these very deadly things that you usually can't see most of the time called pebble rocks that will stop you dead in your tracks. Often at times you'll either be running away or doing a tactical retreat and they'll potentially get you killed. Another piece of advice is to turn your sensitivity right up and turn the auto aim down. If you don't do that, aiming will often magnetize on everything except the thing that you're trying to hit. Auto aim will often snap onto targets you weren't initially aiming for. Sometimes the button to turn off a light or open a crate doesn't show up. You have to have like the precision of a hawk. And the loading screens uh, for the bigger levels are long. You could probably complete a Lord of the Rings box set while you wait for these things to load. Maybe the Hobbit ones too. There are also some crashes and a few bits of retardation amongst the AIs every now and then. Let me in. Let me in. The English voices on occasion are less convincing than other times, but I had to look this up just in case I felt like I might have been putting my foot into the racial tensions, but it turns out that most of the English voices are people who are not from Russia. Actually, for my second playthrough, I switched the language to Russian. Because after, you know, establishing the basics, knowing what's going to happen, going with a more authentic take the second time felt quite fitting. But the biggest issue this game has is something that has been in the other two games. And for me, that is the silent protagonist, Artyom. I just think that if he wasn't muted throughout this whole game, the story could be so much more engaging. And furthermore, a huge part of the narrative revolves around his own ambitions and belief that one day he would find a new life outside the metro. And when he reads his journal out to you in the loading screens, talking about how he's coping with the things he's going through makes you want to get closer to him, but you can't throughout these levels because he doesn't say anything. And when you're out on a mission with another character, you're going to have to deal with these one-sided conversations all the way through that are not really engaging. Like it all. You often feel less like a badass Spartan Ranger and more like a human slave because every single time we run into a problem, the colonel turns up and is like, Right, Artyom, you do everything. Everyone else, you get some rest. You need it. It's like, f what? There's other times when there's like disagreements amongst your fellow Russians and you want to take a side. You want to stand up for what you believe in. So, here's the plan. Shut your fucking mouth! Shut the fuck up, you cunt! Despite all the BS, this game does have a lot of finesse. This game has some of the most impressive graphics I've ever seen, from both the vast scale of the outside world and the claustrophobic underground. Weapons will get dirty and bloody, and that will affect the gun's performance. Sound design, 
beautiful. My favourite being the crossbow. The backpack mechanic is a great new addition. The storyline has many different outcomes. Without spoiling anything, some characters will have different fates depending on your actions. And speaking of the characters, I liked every single one of them. Despite not spending a great deal of time with all of them, you do get used to their company and you draw closer to them. Now, with all the good and bad presented, I still don't feel like I'm hitting home on what this game actually feels like to play, for those of you who may be considering it. This is one of those games you won't see its full potential until you've had one epic triumph. And for me personally, that epic triumph was cleaning out an entire base without alerting a single enemy. Before you hit that high, however, you're going to have to experience failure and humiliation. Now you think of any challenging video game that you've played and try and remember that ticking time bomb inside you that was just waiting to go off and would probably end up with you having to go out and buy yourself a new TV, new controller, and depending on your condition, maybe a new window as well. Metro Exodus is a much more challenging game in terms of the stealth aspect. It's not games like Metal Gear Solid where you can ping all the enemies before you move in, or most other games anyway, that are third person where you can actually see more than the character. It's much easier to mine your surroundings. In Exodus, you can only see what's in front of you, and sometimes you'll get spotted without even realising it. Your best friend in these situations, of course, is going to be the shadows. Keep an eye on that blue indicator that informs you if you're hidden or not, which also ties into my next piece of advice, and that is play in night. Performing stealth in daytime is hard, but if you reckon you've grasped the rules of how stealth works, you go test yourself on it. I know I still am. It's not a game I would recommend going in guns blazing. I mean, if that's how you think you'll get the most fun out of it, then go ahead, whatever floats your boat. But take a prime example of this trope like Call of Duty. It fits it perfectly, because the mechanics in that game are much more snappier, they're more responsive, and they run pretty smoothly the whole way through. Metro's mechanics are much more inconsistent. It's still enjoyable, but it does not compare at all to the cocktail of emotions you go through while cleaning up an enemy stronghold one by one. The precision and timing you need to launch a throwing knife into someone's skull and then quickly taking out his buddy next to him before he gets a chance to react, all the meanwhile making sure that no one else near was looking in that direction, quickly blowing out torches so nobody can see you, even the little tune that plays every now and then when you walk into the light gets you nervous, even though you've not done anything wrong. There's just no comparison. It's a challenge, and I know for a fact, because of experience, this game will make you rage once in a while. Like I said earlier, in order to become better, you've got to go through failure a few times, but nine times out of 10, it's your own fault. And I always took notes on that, whether it was not being patient enough or maybe just being unaware of my surroundings, there was always something wrong. If at any point while you're playing this game, you say something along the lines of, this game, or I'm done, then you're on the right track. You are playing this game like it was meant to be played. Now, after my first playthrough, which I did approach pretty mindlessly, I was going to give this game an 8 out of 10. But after my second playthrough, this time with a more realistic and vigilant approach, and getting those high feelings more often than usual, I suddenly understood this game much more for what it was intended to feel like. And because of that, this game has got to be a 9 out of 10 for me. And with the fun collectibles and achievements to unlock, if you're into that sort of stuff, there is plenty of replay value here in this package. And with a long drawn out wait for all these new games to arrive in the fall, this should qualify easily as a little filler. Right, that's the video. Uh, you guys can f*** off now. Love you guys, bye! You're not gonna fucking wave back and just leave. I've had a fucking enough. Wave?